So it looks like it only took Togashi one chapter to get into the flow of things before he can completely shock us with some incredible revelations. My jaw dropped when I read Hunter Hunter chapter 392, and my Twitch chat can attest to that. I watched it or read it for the first time with them watching me as well, and I was uh, kind of taken aback. I'll see if I have the clip, I might be able to enter it in here to insert it right here. Uh, what powers he has. Now that you mention it, if he has the ability to change his height, isn't this whole plan pointless? It is fun, Andres. Over there. Excuse me? What the hell? Why is he so casual with it? But either way, this was a monumental chapter, just the second of this batch, and Togashi is already pulling out all the stops. This chapter has tons of implications and tons of uh, value and substance, not just because of the Hisoka reveal, um, that's obviously the highlight, but there is so much more to, to sort of dig into in terms of things that can be discussed and uh, talked about with regards to uh, the different Mafia factions, the Zhiyu family, Hinrig, and... Uh, the whole Misha thing, Hisoka's new motives, uh, Zakuto and Lynch and what their possible potential uh, role could be, how they're leading Hisoka to their boss, that could be amazing, um, and the Phantom Troop and the implications there and some, some plot details as well. Let's just get into it. There is so much to talk about here. I wasn't really sure that I would be super invested in the Mafia, the Mafia mind games, the Mafia motives, and you know, how they branch out from the families and their benefactors and their role in the plot. But it has been uh, really, really exciting, especially since the comeback in these past two chapters. And I, they're one of the most uh, intriguing elements of the plot at the moment, likely in part due to how they're associated with Hisoka, the Phantom Troop, and uh, the different benefactors as well. But everything's intermingled in this plot, so naturally, uh, any given element is going to be embedded in others, and I just think the Mafia are more interesting than I thought they'd be. So kudos to Togashi for that, because yeah, I wasn't super into them from the start. So we start with the aftermath of Hinrig versus Padui. Um, we know Henry killed Padui at, right at the end of that fight, and so this is the immediate aftermath. People are looking on, people are, uh, you know, trying to understand what's going on. It's a huge commotion. But then, oddly enough, we see Padui get up and just seem to be all right. Henry covers it up, he, he makes up some cover story, and things seem to be okay, and things are brushed off. And there's a bit of a crisis averted as the public kind of disperses after they dismiss this, using whatever cover-up this is. And what happens after this is Henry comes into contact with an, uh, a, a soldier. This guy helped Henry cover it up, and he says, you know, you can't keep doing things like this if you want us to properly cover for you. Henry says, sure. And then this soldier then says, we have information about Morena's location. They eventually haggle a little bit, and Henry does buy the information for it, but this soldier is very kind of odd, off-kilter, a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit sketchy, so I'm not sure that he can be trusted, and I'd actually put my money on him not being able to be trusted, so we'll see what happens there. But the point is, Hinrig, I'm sure he's a little bit wary of him at the very least, accepts this deal and pays for this information about Morena's whereabouts, uh, about the whereabouts of her headquarters or her base. We'll see how it plays out, but now he is on the way, supposedly, to Morena's base. It may not just be that straightforward, we will see. Then we see, though, however, the reason that Padui was just able to get up and, you know, walk it off, essentially, is because he was being controlled by Misha. This is who Henrik was referring to, I'm counting on you, Misha. What is happening here is Misha is a dead member of the Zhiyu family. She works off of some post-mortem, post-death Nen, which allows her to attach herself to the bodies of people that I guess the Zhiyu family has killed, to then ultimately benefit the Zhiyu family by allowing things to be inconspicuously disposed of. So she gets up with him, he seems to be okay, he walks away, and then he's gonna be disposed of. Padui will be. So now, obviously, Nen is baked into the stories, uh, into the characterization of the story, of the characters, whatever. And so the fact that this post-mortem Nen activates for Misha to do this for any bodies or whatever that needs to be disposed of, she must have had immense, immense uh, commitment to the Zhiyu family. She must have been some sort of a, a loyal soldier. She must have been uh, very dedicated to the cause. And so all of this really just makes me think and stop and pause about her. You know, what was her relationship with Henrik or the rest of the members? What 
what was her, what were her philosophies what was she like in life for her to have such dedication such that she is able to enact this post-mortem nen ability to ultimately benefit her family even after she's gone she's passed on it's just such a powerful use of it and it just makes you stop and think about what her relationship may have been with other members, what her relationship was like with the family, her upbringing. It's all so very human, and all of this uh, thought that it inspires in me is done simply through a few sentences, a few short sentences about Misha's power and how it activates, and knowledge of just what Nen is as a power. That is just the beauty of Nen in a nutshell. You understand what's going on here, and you can add substance and apply it to all sorts of different plot threads and characters and elements to then theorize, you know, uh, or wonder, at least, at the very least. It's it's great. I love the detail of what Misha ended up being. It wasn't the cat, it wasn't something else, it ended up being this dead mem member of the family. And notably, um, I think it's just a coincidence, but notably, her face does look quite a, quite similar to uh, Sid Yidnik, Fourth Prince's um, Nan Beast. But yeah, what type of close-knit family was this? What were their operations? What was Misha's role? I don't know, that may never ever be answered, but nonetheless it inspires thought in me and I love that element to the story. We then cut to the other members of the Zhiyu family, uh, Mafia, branch, looking for Hisoka, Zakudo, and Lynch. Zakudo is using his blood heroes to continue to look out for uh, Hisoka. They find some random guy and they go, are you Hisoka? They question him, Lynch uses her power as well, it ends up being a dud, naturally. We wouldn't expect them to find Hisoka right away, would we? Would we? And they just look down the hall and they go, oh, is this, uh, let's try this guy. Okay, let's try this guy. And it ends up literally just being Hisoka just standing there with his sexy ass suit, just looking around, just vibing. No disguise, nothing whatsoever, which is interesting because, you know, people would talk, uh, people in-universe in the story would talk about how Hisoka's gonna have, uh, you know, transformed himself or in disguise or whatever, and they would look for his height as the determining factor about whether he's there, uh, whether it could be him or not. And I didn't really question it much because Hisoka has changed a lot in recent developments. After his fight with Krolo, his tact has changed. He's become much more serious. He's become much more gunning for the end result rather than the experience during, if you know what I mean. So it didn't seem very Hisoka for me for him to be totally disguising himself in this way. Uh, it felt much more appropriate for him, or in character, for him to be waiting himself for other people, or more out in the open, or whatever. But these people were theorizing that he was in disguise, and even if it didn't feel completely right, I was going, maybe he's changed his character, maybe he's, maybe he has different motivations or different methods for this end result. Um, it was kind of like a wait-and-see sort of basis to see why he would be being do, doing something much less Hisoka-esque. But it turns out, no, he wasn't doing that at all, at least not that we know of, and he was just being same old Hisoka. But he's notably very different. We'll get into that in a, in a little bit. Lynch questions him. She tries to be the one asking the questions. She has no idea who she's dealing with. Poor Lynch. Um, and Hisoka essentially just knocks her out. Uh, I thought initially that she might have she might have died, that he might have killed her. Uh, she's just knocked out. He then takes the flow and momentum of this uh, interrogation, I guess. And then with Lynch at the ground just moaning and Zakuto looking on very fearfully, he demands to know what the hell's going on. He says, I ask the questions now. And he is notably very fearsome, very to the point, very pragmatic, and seems to be using them uh, for his own means. Zakuto is freaking out, this poor boy. He is losing his shit. He has no idea what's going on. He is uh, terrified for himself and Lynch, I'm sure. And Hisoka just ultimately, like I said, takes complete momentum, and uh, Zakuto gives up what's going on. He gives it up. He says, all these people are looking for you, and uh, I will take you to my boss or to their base. So he says here, I'll take you to my boss, to my base, my headquarters, whatever. So if he is being truthful, uh, as it seems he might be due to the fear in his eyes, who knows, but it seems truthful to me, he would be taking him to Zhang Lei, the third prince, who, who is their benefactor. Or actually, I don't remember at all if their headquarters would lead them to Zhang Lei. Maybe their headquarters is in a different location. I just thought of that just now. Um, I would need to refresh my memory. Either way, they're getting to closer to the head of the snake of Hisoka, if they're actually taking Hisoka to the headquarters of their family and where they get their orders and everything. And so Hisoka is getting closer to these 
princes, a uh, third prince potentially, while at the same time Henrik is supposedly being shown to Morena. So these characters are getting closer to their respective heads of the snakes that they're involved with in these different plot lines. We'll see how those go. I don't think either of those will be as straightforward, but we'll see. Either way, Zakura was struck with the fear of God, and Hisoka has taken complete control of this, it seems like, and he is making progress, and he is, you can bet, he's gonna be able to use whatever means possible. At this point, he has Zakuro, he has Lynch, he has some leverage for sure, and he could get more in the future to then get information about the troop and either have them seek him out or him find out where they are. But either way, Hisoka is on the move, and we know exactly what he's doing for the first time, and it is so exciting. We then cut to, I don't remember who exactly his name, or what exactly his name was, but this spider Phantom Troop fanboy, the biggest fanboy in the world who goes through great pains to try to get uh, autograph paper from one of the merchants on the ship. We then learn that, uh, through his conversations, that things can actually get transported from the old world, uh, the mainland, if you want to call it that, the world that the series had taken place on prior to this, things get transported from there to the boat by blimp or some sort of drone or something like that, uh, if those items have priority. And that means if they are sent, uh, if the requests are sent by upper tiers, by sort of the aristocrats or the people with more power. So we get this information, and this could just be Togashi throwing in a detail about you know, this is how this boat functions, um, this this is just how it is, similar to in York New, how they talked about uh, all, those, those, all those things with Sapile and the black market and all that stuff, for no other reason than to just kind of, well, they, it had some application, but overall, just to sort of enrich our knowledge and to build the world and make it feel more dimensional and just add details to it. This could just be Togashi doing that with the boat and how it functions and how these operations work, or this could be foreshadowing for some sort of plot element down the line. Um, someone, something being transported to the ship, that could easily be a factor in the future, so we'll put a pin in that, and we'll see where it goes. It's definitely an enticing plot prospect, and it could just be totally done for random world-building Togashi detail in, in the way he likes to do sometimes, but if I had to bet on something, I would say it will have some sort of relevance later on, so we'll keep an eye on that. We then cut to the Cha'ar family. I still don't really know how to pronounce that. And we get to see their leader, or this guy who's who's sort of leading discussions, uh, Wang. He's very distinguished, he definitely has an aura of authority around him, but he is very wary of the troop, which is the take-home point here. He's talking about how it's very tactical, you should be very careful, be careful around Hisoka, be careful around the troop, just generally be tactical and be very wary. Because what he ultimately ends up saying is we will use Hisoka to then crush the troop and crush Morena. You know, best of luck with that, not sure how that's gonna go, but nonetheless it's a very interesting plot prospect, which then gears up the tension even more for what's going down. This mafia stuff is really, really heating up. But yeah, he wants to use Hisoka to crush the Hailee family, to crush the troop, and they kind of set out, and we'll see where things go from there. Some nice uh, substantiating of the Cha'ar family as well, and like I said, I'm really a fan of what's going on with all the Mafia family stuff. And then for our last cut, we cut to the actual Phantom Troop. It wasn't enough for us to have Hisoka, the reveal of Misha, which I thought was really cool, but we cut to the actual troop now, well, part of the troop, as we see Phaeton, uh, Finks, and Nobunaga, three of my faves, uh, just kind of chilling and vibing around, and they're discussing things, they're talking about the way forward and what they should really do, and how to approach it. They then mention Franklin, and should we get Franklin to help us, and then we could go out in, in teams of two, so partners a bit more safer, they could do it in shifts. Uh, I automatically thought, uh, Franklin's not going anywhere. We last saw him say, you know, I'm staying right here. Hisoka's gonna come to me, so I'm gonna wait for him. Uh, I thought that's why he would stay, but then they also said that he hates confined spaces, which is interesting, quirky. Suddenly, they're put under attack, and we see Luini, another hardcore fan of the Phantom Troop, who pulls his best shining impression as he kind of does a here's Johnny through the door looking at the troop. And he's going like, what are you guys doing? I read on your Wikipedia entry, your Wikipedia entry, that uh, you guys are a brutal band of murderers and thieves, and why are you just sitting here? Why are you being all tactical? Shouldn't you just betray the, the, the Char'ar family and then just kill all these stuck-up nobles and aristocrats and just 
make this whole entire boat a bloodbath as you search for Hisoka? Shouldn't you be doing that? Because that's what I like about you. That's why I'm such a fan of you. Uh, that's you, right? You're this brutal band of murderers and thieves. To which they respond, are you an idiot? Uh, Finks essentially just goes, what the hell kind of people do we do you think we are? You just think we'd mindlessly slaughter these people for no point, um, just totally reckless. Uh, no, that's not what we're about to do. And this guy, Luini, is very disappointed. He, he, it, it's very meta in a way. He got this idea of who they were, uh, of who the Phantom Troop were in his mind and built them up as this, but totally misinterpreted them the whole time, not understanding the heart of why they do these things in the first place. For example, the Phantom Troop, they do love slaughtering people and killing people, uh, specifically individual members, Phaeton being one of them. But... They don't do it for the hell of it. They don't just do mindless slaughter for the hell of it. There's always a point. And so you think of their massacres. You think of Uvogen, Uvogen's Requiem. The reason for that was a tribute to their long-lost friend. The reason for that was the emotional sentiment behind it. That's why they did it. That's that's the core reason why Krola wanted to do it in the first place and why they carried it out. To make this huge bang that would service or that would be uh, worthy of the name Uvogen. And so that's a great example to think of for why they don't just do mindless slaughter. They do it for a reason. Uh, Phaeton, who even loves mindless slaughter, we've just seen him torturing people, which he does love doing, don't get me wrong, but to get information to benefit the spider for the overall uh, entity to contribute to the overall philosophy. So there, there's a big emphasis here on the fact that they don't just, they aren't just mindless psychopaths who kill people for no reason and who aren't tactical. Like, they're also another important aspect here is they're very smart. They know that just going rampant and killing everyone is not the way to do this. They have to be very tactical, they have to be very astute and mature to gradually uh, get Hisoka out of the shadows and understand where he is, and then take him on from there. But just mindlessly going about it is not going to help anyone and it's not part of their philosophy. So it's interesting here, as Togashi kind of, in a very meta way, clarifies the roles of the Phantom Troop and their psychology and why they do a lot of the things they do. They don't do it f because of the means, or because of the method, rather. They do it to overall serve the troop, to uh, overall benefit the entity, and to contribute to their family in one way or another, their, their right to exist in one way or another. So as I was reading this in chat, a lot of people, uh, specifically Shadow, for example, Shadow brought up, uh, from chat, brought up Zeno. It reminded him a lot of Zeno and how Zeno said to Krolo in episode 52, I believe it was, you believe that we kill for pleasure. We don't do that. It's for the overall business, for the philosophy. It's for this thing that is greater than ourselves. Uh, Zeno is very much for the business, the Zoldic family is very much for the business, and the troops seem to say something very similar here through what Fink says. There always seems to be a point to it. Emotional, sentimental, logistical, to benefit the spider and overall contribute to the spider, which then brought up the topic of the Kurta slaughter, the Kurta massacre. You know, we know they wanted to get the red eyes of the Kurta, but was there more to it? Was it just a random attack because they heard that they were there and they said, let's just kill them because we want their treasures and uh, this will fetch us a, a hefty price and this is such a valuable treasure. Um, there does seem to be an element, you know, there is a point to that. There is a point to that. So it's not mindless, but there does seem to be an element of just a scattershot to it. Was there more to their Kur Kurta slaughter? Was there more of a reason for it? Was it not random? This is something we were talking about in chat on Twitch as I read through the chapter, and I don't know, it, it just really brings up that thought in your mind, right? Was there more to that Kurta, that Kurta slaughter? And if so, what? And what could that tell us about the Phantom Troop? It's crazy. You are constantly learning more and more about Krolo, more and more about the Spider. What an what an amazing antagonistic group. And we just seem to... Uh, it's just an endless well of substance there. Uh, and intrigue and theorizing. And I love what this chapter is subtextually added to it, just through a few little lines. So we'll see if that ends up being substantiated further, or if that was just a one-off sort of thing. Again, just like we were talking about with the plot detail about the the, the blimps and the drones. Uh, so we'll see where that goes, but 
Oh man, my mind has been open to all sorts of other directions that the troop could go in from here uh, as things ramp up to the conclusion or climax of the Succession War. Luini then says, oh really, you're like that? You don't like mindless slaughter? I think your uh, wiki entry needs to be ed edited. And it was at this point where I said, you know, Luini has totally misinterpreted the type of people these th this troop is. Uh, and being this fanboy, very opposite to the other guy who just wanted an autograph, bless his heart, showing two sides of the fandom there, as someone in chat has told me as well. Uh, but so he's totally misinterpreting the spirit of why they do these things in the first place. Man. And then it ends right there with Nobunaga essentially saying, someone should edit that entry to say that we don't really tolerate fools who piss us off and waste our time as he kind of gets ready to fight. So are we about to see Nobunaga throw hands with uh, Luini? I'd be down for it. Uh, we haven't seen Nobunaga do his stuff in a long time. So uh, really exciting stuff. I can't wait to see where it goes. And that's where the chapter ends. Amazing chapter, 10 out of 10. We have the obvious Hisoka revelation, but we also got some really interesting thought food for Misha, for what Misha is, amazing imagery, very haunting and adding to the overall uh, dark, dreary tone of the Succession War uh, aesthetically. Also giving us some bits of substance for the Zhiyu family and lots of thought food for that. Um, we got some nice stuff for Hinrig and where he's going to apparently find Morena. We'll see how that goes with the sketchy uh, guard. And then Zakuto and Lynch are taking Hisoka to their base. We'll see how that goes too. Um, Hisoka now has a foothold and he has some means to then potentially branch out and try and find the Phantom through, Troop through uh, what, whatever he's going to do. So we'll see how that develops as well. Then at the same time, the Phantom Troop are about to combat with Luini, and we got some amazing substance for their potential motives and learning more about them and looking at them from a different perspective. Or not entirely different, but it's not like we thought they were mindless, totally mindless before this, but it's cool to see their thoughts on the matter. To see Fink say what he says, uh, about why they do what they do. I'm a Phantom Troop fanboy just like the two we saw here, though I'm much more of the autograph sort of guy than the second sort of guy, while not endorsing what they do, of course. Always need to say that. Um, so any any Phantom Troop details, right up my alley. And things are coming to a head uh, with pretty much every element of this Mafia uh, family tussle. Uh, the, the micropolitics and everything, things are developing and things... I think pretty soon we're going to have the powder keg go off. Uh, maybe in maybe after the next few chapters. We'll have to see. Either way, thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you thought about this chapter. What score you'd give it. Uh, what you thought of the plot elements and the revelations and the bits of theorizing we can get from it. How you reacted to Hisoka's reveal and all that. Um, please let me know. Please share your thoughts. If you'd like to watch uh, my first reactions to these chapters, you can follow me on Twitch where I do that every week. I think it'll usually end up being Fridays. We'll We'll see how it goes for the unofficial translation and then i obviously read the official one as well but either way follow me on twitch if you're interested in that and want to partake you can check out the discord server which will be linked in the pinned comment and that's about it thank you guys so much for watching and yeah feel free to share your thoughts uh, what an amazing chapter i can't wait to see where things go from here many thanks for watching guys and see you uh, next time